The following content contains material that may be triggering to some audiences. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hope Discovered Podcast by ComQuest. My name is Bill. Central to our theme here is that recovery is possible. Oftentimes, we have guests share their own personal journey of hope from their experiences with trauma, mental health, or addiction. Other times, we have professionals offer insights into the fields of recovery or updates for what we are doing within the community. Today, we have a little of both. Our guest today is Matt Calder, the CDX manager at Altman Hospital for ComQuest. How are you doing today, Matt? Welcome to the program. Very well, Bill. Thank you. Awesome. Matt often shares his own personal journey of recovery, and he's here to do that for us on this episode of the podcast. Let's start with where you are at now. Tell us a little bit about your position here at ComQuest and what your duties entail. So I'm the unit manager and one of the counselors at ComQuest Detox. We're located on the sixth floor of Altman Hospital. And uh, for all types of addictions, particularly alcohol, benzodiazepines, and of course, opioids, uh, we provide a a safe place for medical detox um, as well as clinical counseling, uh, case management, we try to get them linked up with services following detox, get them on the road, the journey of recovery. Um, uh, we take them all day, all night, um, and it's generally going to be a five to eight day stay. And and we try to give them every bit of uh, empathy and love that they can get while they're on the unit um, before they go back out into the world. That is fantastic. It's so critical. And it, it, I know it's a very difficult um, thing to do. You guys are certainly on the front line of what this uh, what this community needs. Are you from this area? Are you from Stark County? I am. I was born and raised uh, in Plain Township, went to Glen Oak High School. All right. Uh, what kind of a, a kid were you? I have a feeling uh, that you were somewhat of an ornery, rambunctious type. Is that how you were when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I was a little bit hyperactive. Um but I, I should preface that with saying um, I had a wonderful childhood. I have two loving parents, a great home. Um, you know, I never wanted or needed for anything. Um, I was a decent student and then I was a good athlete. Uh-huh. Um, I was actually uh, a cross country and, and track kid in high school and I was really good. And so it's at the point where my senior year, I was getting recruited by Division One colleges and I would go on these visits. They'd fly me out and I'd... I had a good friend at another school rival that was already a freshman at North Carolina, Charlotte. And he, uh, he talked to his coach about me and they flew me down for a recruiting trip. And, uh, when I was down there, they had a keg party, um, which I think they often do for recruits and stuff to, you know, make them maybe want to come to that college more. And, uh, mind you, I had never been drunk before in my life. And, uh, as I, Went, entered this party um, anxious and unsure of myself and definitely not comfortable in my own skin, which will be a recurring theme. Um, they said, we're going to play a drinking game. And they gave me a big gulp cup of beer. And they said, we're going to play a game called Circle of Death. And essentially, it's you drink the number on the card that gets laid in front of you if it's the suit that was called. And the first suit that was called was hearts. And as they passed the cards around, the first person to get a card with hearts on it was me. And it was the queen of hearts. And I had to drink 13 chugs out of this big gulp of beer. And then because I forgot to call a new suit before I put the cup down on the table, I had to drink another 13. Needless to say three, four rounds go by and I stand up for the first time and the feeling that came over me, the inebriation, the profound, powerful, out of my skin experience uh, was just otherworldly. And I remember thinking to myself as I'm looking around and perfectly able to talk to girls and dance in front of everybody and just be the life of the party for the first time in my life. I remember thinking, I'm going to do this whenever I can. Um, And I did. 
the next day when I woke up hungover, going to have to go to meet the coach for a breakfast, um, some of the people that were at the party the night before were having what they called hair of the dog, which I didn't know what that meant. But I cozied up next to them and I drank more off of that stale keg. Went to meet the coach inebriated. Needless to say, my freshman year in college started to consist of, um, you know, first it was just Friday and Saturday nights. Then it became Thursday nights. And of course, Monday nights because of Monday night football. I would find myself every so often waking up in the morning in a bush on campus completely naked, not knowing what the heck happened and having a, had a blackout drunk. And I'd like to tell you that if somebody had sem- said something to me then that I was already a problem drinker, I would have, the whole course of my life would have changed. But I, I can tell you for a fact it wouldn't have because I liked it too much. And in college, it's just Animal House, right? That's what you do. Time goes on and I'm, I'm close to drinking just about every night. I have an excuse for it. And the idea of drinking a beer um, uh, or, or two because you enjoy the beer was foreign to me. When you drink, you drink to get drunk. You drink to get inebriated. And crazy stunts and, and, and horrible happenings and we would get drunk and streak around the campus, take all our clothes off and run from one frat house to the next. And one night I got caught up in the bushes by the North Carolina State Highway Patrol. And a recurring theme in my life over the the decades was State Highway Patrolmen don't like me. Um, They never laugh at my jokes. They're very stern. Um, And this, this state trooper who had to be six foot six stood in front of me and I'm, I'm buck naked and cold and, and drunk out of my mind. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. And it, and it gives me chills as I say it. He looks down at me and in this North Carolina drawl says, boy, you going to jail naked. And my whole life, short as it was at that point, because I was only 19, flashed before my eyes. And they put me in the back of a cruiser um, where I urinated all over and, uh, they made me sit there in fear for about a half hour before they ended up taking me back to, uh, where I was staying. And, and I walked right back into that party and, uh, sure enough, I was a legend, you know, and, and it, and it just kind of lubricated my drinking career from there. There was no consequence, at least none that I saw. Months later, me and teammates would trash a hotel room and I would be kicked off the track team and asked to go pursue my education elsewhere. And I did. Such that by the time I was at the end of my college career, I was a CB student, occasionally minus. I dropped classes. It was really more about drinking. I fell out of athletics. Um, I, I, things that I should have been taking seriously just weren't serious enough to me. Um, I just wanted the quick and easy fun. I, uh, Left Canton, Ohio, and moved to Phoenix, Arizona, looking for some adventure. And uh, I answered an ad in the paper um, for a sales job. Not sure what I was going to sell. And uh, I called it, and they asked me to come in for an interview. And I rushed down to Salvation Army and bought some old man dress-up clothes and interviewed for a position to sell cars. And I was hired, and uh, turns out I'm a good salesman. And uh, everything took off. And the great thing about selling cars is... You can do it and then close the bar every night and you're perfectly, you perfectly fit in. Um, Would work 70, 80 hour weeks, bell to bell, they called it, and then go close the bar. And I fit in. Nobody noticed. Um, Needless to say, I was also working with a lot of alcoholics and addicts at the time. The years went on and I, uh, I was really, really good at sales. First, I was a salesman, then I'm a assistant sales manager, and then I'm a finance manager, and then I'm a finance director, and I'm making these absurd amounts of money for my age. And I'm drinking um, to get through it all. And I'm doing all the things that you're supposed to do. You have a baby, have a wife, buy a house, buy toys, um, appear to be happy and successful. Um, All the while, uh, I have to constantly, constantly be drinking when I'm not at work. Well, eventually the point came where I was introduced to cocaine Um, and cocaine and alcohol for someone like me are two great tastes that go great together. And uh, I could drink longer um, and I could recover easier. 
And in the car business, there were times when there was just community cocaine in the in the bathroom for everybody to take part of. It just it just all flowed together. Problem was, is I was burning the candle at both ends, and I, I, I wasn't a present father, a present husband. I wasn't a good communicator. I was constantly angry. At times, my wife would threaten to leave. I'd go to AA for a meeting, and I'd, I'd love to hear what they say, and it really hit me, and I'd start sobbing when they asked me to talk a little bit, and everything was, wow, this is it. This is what I need to do. I need to stop. But then somebody would tap me on the shoulder and say my, my wife was out in the parking lot, and she was so proud of me, and she was waiting for me, and all of a sudden, I was cured again, and I would get up and go out because I knew that she wasn't leaving me. That cycled again and again and again. When she finally did leave me and I was with another woman, I, I, I was at the point where I had to drink before I got home. I had to stop and get these little shooters, these little fruit shooters of Banana 99, they were called. And they were 99 proof banana liqueur shots. I would buy five or six, one or two tall boys, and I would sit in my car that I left work 20 minutes early, sit in my car and pound a shot, chase it, pound a shot, chase it get home. I needed to do that just to be present. Um, eventually, I would have to do that at lunch. I would tell my girl at the time that I was going to pick up running again, and I would put on all these running clothes, and, I, and then I would go out and I would run down to the liquor drive through, three blocks down from the house, buy a bunch of shots and a couple tall boys. Then I would go and I'd sneak into the dark alleys behind neighbors' yards, and I would drink a shot, chase, drink a shot, and chase. Now I'm at the point where even people at work um, think I have a drinking problem. And that's saying something in the car business, um, that you stick out. Um, the things that were happening now um, were out of my control. I didn't know how I was affecting my wife, my son. Um, I would call my parents and make up reasons why I needed money um, because now I, I, I was financially destitute too. I would say I lost my house and my cars and all of those things, but the truth is, is I gave them away. Um, in the end, I was living in a one-bedroom apartment and I could no longer afford cocaine. So I was introduced to something at the liquor drive through called bath salts, which at the time were this newly synthetic street drug that was supposed to mimic or be like cocaine, but much cheaper. And they were cheaper, but um, the effect wasn't exactly like cocaine. Um, it was basically more that I was doing meth. I got to the point where I weighed about 142 pounds. Um, would wake up in the middle of the night in a trance, not knowing where I was, shave my head completely bald, paint demon face on. One night I found myself wandering around my apartment complex. Mind you, at this point, I'm living in a single bedroom studio apartment. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wandering around and I have a butcher knife in my hands. Out of my mind. And but for the grace of God, go I that something horrible didn't happen. I'm peeking out the blinds, thinking the CIA's after me, paranoid, seeing people, seeing things. And I'm at the point where I'm unemployable. I'm about to lose the apartment. I've already picked out a bridge. I was suicidal. I was homicidal. Um, I was lost. And, and, and the darkness and the misery of it was, uh, to this day, I, I can't believe how far I'd let it gotten. There were nights where I would sit down with my drug of choice, these bath salts and tall boys of beer and liquor, and I would dial 911 on my cell phone because I thought that night might be the night that I have the heart attack. So I dial 911 because, you know, that was a completely rational thing to do. In case I needed to hit the send button, I'd be ready because, you know, I have this all under control. And I spent 18 months doing that, going from job to job, letting everybody in my life down, not falling, not living up to the standards I set for myself. In the end, when I had nowhere to go and 
nobody to employ me, no way to uh, pay a bill. I had to come back home to Ohio. And that last night there, I drank and used up every last drug that I could find in my apartment. Smoked everything I could find in the carpets. We call it carpet surfing. And when my ex-wife picked me up at about 5 a.m. to take me to the airport, um, my son was with her. He was 10 years old at the time. Wonderful kid. And uh, at the airport departure gate, I got down on my knees to say goodbye to my son and his big, beautiful blue eyes. He was looking at me and he was crying and I had white crumbs falling out of my nose because I could no longer be bothered to chop it up at that point. I was just me, me, me. And my son looked at me and he said, Daddy, whatever I did wrong, I'm sorry. I won't do it anymore. Please don't leave. And all the consequences over the years, all the the black flags, the red flags, the moments. That was the moment where I knew it was the beginning of the end. This poor, innocent 10-year-old boy thought he had done me wrong and I was leaving him. Couldn't understand why I was always in the bathroom. Why when I picked him up, I smelt like alcohol. Why I avoided all the soccer moms at his school. Why I always had to go to the bathroom when we went to lunch and stay there for about 10, 15 minutes. I put him through that. The five and a half hour flight from Phoenix, Arizona to Ohio was the longest five and a half hours of my life. And the look on my brother's face when I came out of the airport gate, weighing 140 some pounds, um, with nothing but a few clothes to my name was, uh, for lack of a better term, ironically, sobering. So I'm living at home with my brother and then my parents, and uh, I'm desperate, and I'm still not quite figuring out how to go 24 hours without having a drink or a drug. And uh, I decide um, I'm going to drink some gas station vodka, figure this all out and uh, things get a little crazy and I go to the crisis center on 12th street and I meet a doctor named Dr. Andriozzi. Um, I sleep it off for about four or five days. I come out of there. I go to a meeting called covenant on Saturday night in Canton. I notice that a man keeps looking at me and signaling to a woman and they're both like signaling across the room from each other, looking at me. And I'm getting pretty upset about it. I'm a miserable son of a gun. Um, And uh, I don't know what's going on, but at the end of the meeting, I just want to get out of there. And uh, the man approaches me and says, hi, my name's Steve. and, 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 And I feel like I sense what's going on with you. I see what you're all about. And if you'd like, I'm here for you to talk. And and if you want, you can meet me at my home group on Monday nights. It's at East Canton. If you think you could stay sober for a night, And for whatever reason, I was so broken, desperate, and alone, and vulnerable, I had just given it all up. I I was willing, no matter what, to just lay it all on the line and be honest with somebody, anybody that was willing to listen and kind of understood me. So I did. I stayed sober that Sunday night, and I met him at East Canton that Monday night. And he introduced me to a whole group of guys who took me in and made me a part of their family. The next day I showed up at ComQuest on Market and I met a counselor named Joan, Joan Arnold. And mind you, over the years, I've been in front of plenty of counselors whom I kind of ate up for breakfast. But for whatever reason, Joan Arnold, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to make her happy. I wanted her to be proud of me. I wanted her to approve of what I was doing for some reason. She brought that out in me. And I was in her IOP group and I remember sitting for the first day in her group and looking at the people around me and thinking, I don't belong here. I'm not as bad as these people. And the woman sitting next to me, 
She introduced herself. My name is blank. She was missing almost all of her teeth. And she introduced herself as my name is blank. And I'm a crack whore. And I'm living under a, a bench at this park. And, I, and, and, and that just went further to confirm to me that I did not belong here. And so when I shared for the first time all the things that was going on with me and my problems, my quote unquote problems in life and what I was struggling with, I, I'll never forget um, when she, the blank crack whore turned to me and said, you're an effing idiot. And went down a list of all the reasons I was entitled and ridiculous and needed to get over myself. And in that moment, everything, everything came into focus and changed. I felt such a part of that group and I couldn't wait to go. I couldn't wait three times a week. I'd have done it four or five times a week. Became really close and tight with a lot of those people. My sponsor, I was on a pink cloud and I would tell him all these great things that were happening and this is happening and that is happening. And, and he would say, did you make your bed this morning? And I said, you know, uh, I don't know. But anyways, let me tell you what happened at the meeting last night. And, and he would say, but did you make your bed this morning? And he would repeat and repeat and repeat until finally I said, what? Man, what are you talking about? Did I make my bed? I'm, I'm trying to get sober here. He said, did you make your bed this morning? Because it's the first accomplishment you can have every day and make it a routine. That's all that matters. Because I kept wanting to jump forward. I kept wanting to plan for years ahead. I kept wanting to solve the next mystery, the next riddle. He just wanted me to focus on making my bed in the morning and going to bed clean that night. He would talk to me and I would say things like, I know, I know, as he would talk and I would interrupt him and I'd say, oh, no, I know. And I would say, and I would talk and I would declare all these things I figured out. And he'd say, yeah, but you got to think like this. And I said, I know, I know. And this was in his truck while we were driving down the highway and he pulled it to a screech, slammed on the brakes, pulled over and said, stop saying, you know, because you don't know anything. And I learned a lesson in that moment too. I needed to stop. I needed to shut up. I needed to listen. And that changed everything. Between him and Joan and showing up at meetings an hour and a half early with donuts, cookies, making coffee, everything changed. My life was had meaning it never had before. I take a CDCA class. The next thing you know, I'm hired to work as an RT at Recor in Maslin. They were just opening up. And I'm making $10 an hour, working 3 to 11 on weekends and part of the week. And I've never been happier in my whole life. I, I, I was as happy as could be. I didn't have things. I didn't have a trophy wife. I didn't have, I didn't know where, how I was going to pay my next bill, but I was happier than I'd ever been. I had real relationships. I had real connections, people I could talk to. I was honest with them and I was self-honest most of the time. And as I kind of climbed the ladder a little bit at Recor, and, and, and finally my, my boss there said, I'm going to make you a counselor. Um, <laughs> I mean, man, it was five years ago. I was 142 pounds. This is at that time. And uh, now I, here I am talking to people. So, Bill, I'm, 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 I'm sitting here in front of you now. And um, if I make it to March 6th, Next year, March 6th, 2023, I'll have 10 years sobriety. Mm -hmm. And if you would have saw me 10 years ago, you'd have said, bull, bull crap. No way he's going to get 10 years sobriety. You probably would have thought I was going to die any day because I looked like death, felt like death, smelt like death. I was walking death. And here I am. And uh, I've talked I've helped. I've, I've helped to treat hundreds, maybe thousands of clients at this point. I don't really fit in, so to speak, in this, the clinical world. I'm not like the other counselors and whatnot, but I, it's the same story, right? I, many of them, many of my clients have gone on to be successfully sober, live good lives. Many of the clients have gone on to tragically die, mm. but most of them are all in the middle somewhere trying to figure out which way to go and just waiting to hear something they haven't heard before. Something that sticks because that's what happened to me. Uh, And that's, that's all you can do. And I remind them as it was told to me, just go to bed clean tonight. 
Mm-hmm. Tomorrow's going to happen no matter what. Right. You can always get high again tomorrow. Go to bed clean tonight. And sure enough, day after day, waking up lucid, clear-headed, not hungover, not worrying about what I did the night before, what I said the night before, who I hurt. Now I, I, I'm, I sit here and I haven't thought about a drink or a drug in probably, I don't know, eight, nine years. Oh. Um, and, and, and to say that I have feelings of gratitude and blessings for what's gone on in my life is, is uh, the understatement of the year, so to speak. So that's my story. Your story is extremely well told. What, what, what impresses me about the way you tell your story is there's a humanity in your story. You tell the story in a way that makes you very much come across as a human being. Kind of what I was leading into with this is oftentimes when we hear stories of struggle, of addiction, it's so easy to dismiss that person as someone who, well, that's the path they chose. Your story, hearing that, um, you know, the emotion and the, the power that you tell this story with, it would be very hard, in my opinion, as, as a reasonable, objective person to dismiss your story. Um, I, I don't doubt that that plays a role in, in, in what you do as a clinician. Can you first tell me a little bit about the stigma side of it? When you hear somebody dismiss another human being who may not be able to tell their story as good as you can tell, but they've experienced the exact same path. How do you feel when you hear that stigma being brought up? I'd like you, I'd like to tell you that I always took it with a grain of salt and didn't take it personally, but it takes years to get past that. I can tell you now that Stigma doesn't matter. If, if somebody wanted to introduce me at a meeting or in public with my last name and my social security number and my date of birth and tell them I'm a drunk, I'd be perfectly fine with that. To the, to the addict, the alcoholic struggling, you're fine. You, you're here with me. And I know a whole group of people that are willing to listen and talk to you and know your story, okay? And know where you came from and understand that you're, you didn't intend to hurt people. That you are selfish and self-centered in the pursuit of your high, but you have a moral compass Mm -hmm. and you have worth and you have value. And um, it all starts with that, that self-love because too many addicts come in, not too many, all of them. We come in in a state of Mm self-loathing, guilt and shame and the things I've done, I can't believe I've done. Sometimes when we think about the things we've done, we cringe inside and it's hard to, to get to the next one without just, you know, I just got to get high. Mm -hmm. I just got to numb myself. Well, but deep down, we all want to be better sons, daughters, husbands, wives, parents, Mm -hmm. friends, employees, employers. Um, And so it, it takes a group of us to, to, to be there and willing to listen. I've talked to you before and I've heard you mention that you were a salesman and I'm going to be honest with you. And I mean this as a compliment. I had you pegged for a car salesman immediately. (laughs) And and I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why. Everybody does. Okay. Um, The reason is, is I have some friends who are are also car salesmen and they don't necessarily know a lot about cars. Right. But they just have a way about them. They have a charisma. They're the type of person that, that could convince you, you need to, to take a bag of sand to the beach, you know. Um, and th- that is a talent. You either have it or you don't. My guess is when you are dealing with uh, individuals who, who are struggling, You have a a very uh, powerful way of communicating. You have that nervous charisma around you. Thank Uh, you. Yeah, that's. um, Does do you feel that? Do you sense that when you're talking to a client? So, I'm going to give you an inside tip to sell sales: smile and listen. Mm -hmm. Look them in the eye, smile and listen. It's the same in front of a client who's newly trying to not use. I mean, they're sitting in my office. They need to be heard. They need to know that somebody doesn't feel like this isn't a situation where we can't smile, look each other in the eye, and let's just be honest with each other. 
you gain immediate credibility when you're able to smile and listen. Yeah. And it was the same as far as getting clean. You know, I needed to shut up and listen. And, and so it moves on and you push it forward, you know. I have one more question for you uh, about yourself. In that um, something I picked up early in your uh, in your story there, you had mentioned that in those early days, had someone said something to you, it uh, might have made a difference. And so often uh, when I when I do these stories with people, I hear that they had to hit a wall. In your case, the incident with your child. Yeah. Is there an in between? Uh, do people have to? go to the bottom floor in the elevator before they realize they can go up. Um, can they get off of that sooner? And uh, is it appropriate to tell someone, maybe in not so polite of, of, of a fashion, hey, look, you, you're going to have to get control of this or you, you're going to go down a dark road. How, how, what would be the best advice you would have for somebody who maybe has a loved one who's heading down that path. Is there anything that you can say in a way that they will hear it? So I'm glad you asked that question. Um, it is always appropriate to tell and the addict in your life that's hurting themselves and others that they have a problem and they need to get help. As a loved one, let's go with a parent. It is absolutely appropriate for you to say this to your child. However, I often... I, re I regret to have to say this to parents, but sometimes you have to say to the mom or the dad, but you also sometimes got to let the clown finish their act. Mm -hmm. Say what you need to say and then draw a line. It's okay to say you're not allowed back in this house while you're doing this. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to be at this function with us while you're doing this. You just might lead them to their, whatever their quote unquote rock bottom is quicker because of it. You know, this idea that the rock bottom of an addict has to be this unbelievably morose, tragic, calamitous thing or a burning bush moment. It, that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. I've heard all kinds of rock bottoms, high to low. I, I've heard a rock bottom where it was just, I wanted to be a better librarian. So I decided I wanted to get sober. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the time I judged the woman who said that, but now looking back, I get it. Yeah. Um, it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. It sounds like an after school special whenever people say that. Oh, it's a journey. Let him go on his journey. Not a particular big fan of that <laughs> phrase, but it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. It's the truth. You know, mm -hmm. it'll happen when, when God wills it to happen. Yeah. So great answer. Um, a lot going on in the community. Um, you know, obviously Ohio with the problems with the uh, opioids. And other things, uh, mental health, the uh, pandemic, you know, uh, didn't help that situation. Uh, we talk about the hope happens here at ComQuest. And our, 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 our message at this podcast is that recovery is possible. Sometimes recovery looks a little different for some people than others, uh, but it is possible. There is a better life that is attainable. What message of hope would you have? Well, okay. Let me tell you this, as far as what we do, particularly at detox, um, it is fluid. We, we are live and in, in it when it comes to the things that are going on right now. It's no longer just opioids, just alcohol, just this drug, just that drug. We're, people are, are, are buying something that's everything all in one now. And we recognize that. And we now are seeing the signs and the symptoms of what it is and what it causes and what withdrawal is like and, and how hard it is to come down off and how long it takes. We know all these things. There's, there's nothing that's shocking us at this point and we're prepared. And literally all the time we are seeing people discharge from our unit, show up for an outpatient appointment, do the deal, show up to meetings, get sober support. It's happening. It just doesn't get talked about enough. You know, I think it's, it's a sexier headline to talk about the opioid crisis or how the pandemic has caused alcoholism to come roaring back. Um, but th these things were always there. Yeah. Sure. I, I don't know. They were always there. Yeah. Okay. And we're still dealing with them. And uh, we're not behind the times. I don't even think we're losing the battle. I just think people forget that we're there battling. Yeah. But we are. And we're here. Yeah. So come in. Absolutely. We're here for you. Fantastic story. I am very much a proponent of audio content. And I, I, I just want to point out to you in the audience, 
listening to your story, listening to the humanity in your voice, you get so much more from your story, listening to just your voice than you ever would get from a video. There's something about awesome. hearing that. Uh, it, it goes a couple inches into the microphone and goes right into someone's ear. And it's very powerful and, and, and you master it so well. Thank you so much for being oh, thank here. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Uh, we've been talking to Matt Calder, uh, who works for uh, ComQuest here as a unit manager and what we refer to as our, our detox unit. Uh, if you would like to know more about what we do here at ComQuest, I would direct you to comquest.org. And once again, that's comquest.org. Matt, thank you again. Thank you, Bill. You're very welcome. And thank you to the audience. Thank you so much for listening to our program today. And we will talk to you again very soon. 